In this video, I'm going to show you step by step how to create a form using CocoBlocks Jet Form Builder. Jet Form Builder is a powerful and user friendly form builder with a drag and drop interface with a wide range of features, including 19 field types like radio field, media field, repeater field. You'll have all the tools you need to create amazing forms. But that's not all. Jet Form Builder goes beyond basic forms. You can create multi step forms, booking forms, subscriptions forms, surveys, and much more. So, without further ado, let's dive right in. I'm going to switch to my dashboard. Make sure you have Jetform Builder installed and activated on your website. If you're unsure how to do that, I have a video on my channel that will show you exactly how. Next, we're going to install another CocoBlock plugin, Jet Style Manager, that will help us with the styling of the form. While the majority of the design will be done in Elementor, there are some limitations to Elementor's design capabilities. So, on those cases, we're going to use Jet Style Manager. So, to install it, I'm going to go to CocoBlock, Updates and Installation. I'm going to go to the More Included Jet Plugins with your license tab and look for it here. Mine is already installed, so it doesn't appear here. Find it and click Install. Next, go to your Install Jet Plugins tab, look for it here and click Activate Plugin. Perfect. Now we can create our first form. To do that, I'm going to go to Jet Form Builder and click Add New. And this will open the Gutenberg Editor. So if you're not familiar with the Gutenberg Editor, don't worry, by the end of this tutorial, you're going to learn everything you need to know. So by default, every time you create a form, it comes with three fields, a hidden field, a text field, and an action button, which is the submit button. We're going to start from scratch, so I'm going to delete them all. The first thing I want to show you is how to name the form. So where it says add title, go ahead and type the name of your form. For example, I'm going to name mine Supercard Booking. Now I want to show you how to add fields to your form. The first way is to navigate to the top left corner of the screen and click the plus icon. This will open up the library that contains all the available fields you can add to your form. And when you hover over each field, a pop-up with a preview will appear providing you with more information about that specific field. So all you need to do is simply click once on the field you want to add. For example, I'm going to pick the text field and instantly it will be added to your form. The second way to add a field to your form is by using a shortcut. So if I'm going to click beneath the text that you just added, you're going to see a message appearing instructing me to type forward slash, which will open up a pop-up with a list of field names. If the field you want to add doesn't appear here, you can continue typing until it appears. So I'm going to type heading, and when it appears, just click on it and it will be added to your form. The third way to add a field is by clicking the plus icon over here, which again will open up a pop-up with a search bar and a list of recently used fields. You can either search for a specific field by typing in the search bar or select one of these fields. If you click the browse all, it will open up the main library that we have seen before. Now let me show you another way. Let's say you already have a field on your form. I have two, a text field and a heading field, and I want to add another text field. So what I can do is select the text field and you will notice a toolbar appearing above the field. This toolbar provides additional options to control and customize this specific field. So if I'm going to click these three dots over here, it will open up more options, and one of them is Duplicate. So if I'm going to click on Duplicate, it will add another text field to my form. But let's say I don't want another text field, and instead I want a different type of field, let's say a radio field. So what I can do is go to the opposite side of the toolbar, you will see the text field icon. Clicking on it will reveal different fields I can transform this text field to. So I'm going to select a radio field, and now it's a radio field. But keep in mind that every field has different options. Now to show you the last way you can add slash duplicate a field to your form, I need to introduce to you to the list view, which is similar to Elementor's navigator. To access the list view, simply click on the three lines icon over here, which will open up the list view. The list view provides a bird's eye view of the fields on your form and their arrangement, making it easier to navigate and edit your content. This view is particularly useful for longer and more complex form structures. We're going to use it a lot. So in the list view, select a field and click on the three dots, which provides the same option as they did in the toolbar, and click Duplicate. So those were the various ways you can add fields to your form, whether it's by clicking the plus icon, using shortcuts, or transforming existing fields. Now let me show you how to delete a field. You can select the field you want to delete either directly from the form itself 
or by using the list view. Once you have selected the field you want to delete, click the three dots and scroll down to the last option, which is Remove Text Field. Click it and it will be removed. Another way to remove a field is by selecting the field directly in the form itself and pressing the backspace or the delete key on your keyboard. Now let me just add a couple of more fields for the next example. So I'm going to click the plus icon and I'm going to add a couple more fields. I'm going to go back to the list view. And now let's say you want to delete multiple fields at once. Hold the shift key and select all the fields you want to remove. Then click the three dots, scroll down and click remove blocks. And those were the ways you can remove fields from your form. Now let's say you've made a mistake and accidentally removed the wrong field. You have two options. You can either use the shortcut Ctrl Z on your keyboard to undo the last action, or you can navigate to the top left corner of the screen. You're going to see two arrows, one for undo and one for redo. We're going to click the undo, and it will bring back the fields you've deleted. The next thing I want to show you is how to rearrange the fields on your form to make a more logical and visual appealing layout. So let's say I want this daytime field to be at the top of the form. The easiest way to do that is to go to the list view, select the field, drag and drop it at the top. Now you can do the same from the toolbar. Click the six dots over here, drag and drop it wherever you want. Another way is using these up and down arrows over here, which will move the field one field at a time. Another way is clicking these three dots over here, move to you're going to see this blue line over here. Use the up and down keys on your keyboard to move it to the position you want and press enter to drop it. So now I have seven feeds on my form stacked one above the other. However, if I want to have two feeds placed next to each other, how do I do that? By using columns. So to add a column, I'm going to go to the top left corner of the screen. I'm going to click the plus icon and in the search bar, I'm going to search for column. I'm going to click it once and it will be added to the form. And now it asks me, what kind of layout do we want? How many child columns I want within this parent column? And these are the options. So I'm gonna pick this 50-50, two equally split columns. I'm gonna click it once and it will be set. To add fields to the columns, you have a couple of options. Firstly, you can click the famous plus icon, which will open a pop-up displaying the recently used fields. So you can pick one of them, or you can use the search bar to find a specific field. I'm gonna add a text field. Another way is to drag an existing field from your form and drop it into the column. By the way, you can do it also from the list view. So if you're gonna go to the list view to check out the column structures, you're gonna see that we have here a parent column with two child columns, and every child column has a field. Now when it comes to the columns toolbar, let's go through the options. If you're gonna click this icon, it will select the parent column. This icon indicates that this is a single column. This is the drag icon, and with this left to right arrows, you can move the column left to right within the parent column. Here you can change the alignment. Here you can set up the dynamic visibility, and these three dots will open a window with more options. You don't have a conversion options in a single column, but you do have in a parent column. Now let's take a look at the right hand side of the Gutenberg editor, known as the setting side. We begin by clicking this three dots icon over here, which provides additional options for the Gutenberg editor. Here you can set up the editor's view. For example, you can uncheck the full screen mode to reveal the WordPress dashboard. I'm going to check it back. You can also switch between different editor's types, explore keyboard shortcuts, and so on. I'm going to leave the settings as they are. The next thing I want to show you is the Jet Style Manager settings. This is the plugin we've installed at the beginning of the video. Currently, you may not see the icon because we need to select the field first. So I'm going to select the field, and now the Jet Style Manager icon appears, this brush icon. I'm going to click on it, and the Settings tab will appear. The Field Style options are divided into separate sections, including Text Input, Content Label, Required Mark, and Descriptions. Within each section, you can control various aspects, such as margin, padding, background color, and more. These settings allow you to customize the visual appearance of each field according to your preferences. Next is the Gutenberg settings icon that we've been using throughout this entire video. It provides two tabs for us to work with. The block tab allows us to access and modify the settings for individual form fields, which are essentially blocks. The second tab is Jet Form, and it's dedicated to configuring the overall form settings. We'll come back to this tab later to explore its functionality in more detail. 
Now let's take a closer look at the settings in the block tab. These settings include common options that will come across in almost every field. So let's go through them. In the general section, we got the field label, which provides context or instructions for this field. In the front end, it's typically positioned above the field. It helps users understand the purpose or input expected for this field. Filling out this field label will automatically fill out the field name, which brings us to the field name. The field name is a mandatory field and cannot be left unfilled. That's why by default, it's automatically filled with the label's name. It also needs to have a unique name. You cannot have two fields with the same name on this form. And it also follows certain guidelines, such as using alphanumeric characters, avoiding spaces, and so on. What the field name does, it helps organize and process the form data accurately in the backend. You can either fill out the name from here or from the fields toolbar. This name will not be displayed in the front end. Next is the field description, which is additional explanatory text or instructions providing to the user regarding this field. It offers further clarification or guidance on how to fill out this field correctly. The description is displayed in the front and below the field. Next is the default value, which is a pre-filled value displayed in the form field when it loads or resets. And it allows the user to either keep, modify, or clear the value before submitting the form. It can be used to provide suggestions or examples, saving users time and effort. This feature is particularly useful for fields like names for logged in users. And you can of course dynamically pull the user information by clicking here and setting up the preset. The source is gonna be user, the get a user ID form is gonna be current user, the user field is gonna be first name, and then click update. I'm gonna cancel. Next is the field type. Field types refers to the different types of input that can be accepted. These field types help ensure that the data entered in the field matches the accepted format and can be processed correctly by the system. For example, if a field is classified as a telephone number, Attempting to enter letters instead of numbers will not go through. The minimum and maximum length symbols refers to the number of characters that are allowed for this field. This feature helps enforce character length for fields like password or text. Moving on to the input mask. Let's enable it. The input mask is a feature that allows you to define a specific pattern or format for this field. Ensuring that the data entered follows the specific structures. It's great for formats like phone numbers, dates, or social security numbers. It will appear inside the field. And here you have additional options controlling the appearance of the input mask. Next is the validation messages or notifications displayed when you fill out your form field incorrectly. Right now it is set to inherent, which means it pulls the messages from the form validations messages, which we'll cover in the jet form tab later in this video. Next is the default option, which uses the validation messages provided by the browsers. In the advanced tab, you have the ability to customize these messages specifically for this field instead of using the generic messages from the form. In the advanced tab, we have the placeholder, which is a temporary or sample text that is displayed inside the field, just like the input mask. It provides guidance to users on what to enter in this field. The add previous page button, ignore this option. We'll use this only with the submit button or with the form page break. The field visibility allows you to decide who can see this field, and you have different options to choose from. And the last one is the CSS class name, which is used to apply specific styling or formatting to this field using CSS. So just to sum up the text that is visible in the front end, we have the label, which is the text above the field, the input mask and the placeholder, which is inside the field, and the description, which is under the field. Now I want to select the column again to show you what you can do in the settings. So I'm gonna select the parent column and go to the block tab. When we've added this column, we've selected two child columns. Here you have the ability to add additional child columns up to six. By default, the stack on mobile option is enabled, which means that the child columns will be displayed one above the other in mobile view. But if you prefer a different layout, you can disable this option. You also have styling options for the text and background color. You can control the font size, but for more advanced styling, you can go to the advanced tab and give it a CSS class name. Now let's move on to the child column. So I'm gonna select the child column, go to the block tab, and here you have control over the width of each column. So instead of having two evenly split child columns like we do now, I can go and change these two percentages and make it 30, which makes the other one 70%. So it depends on your needs. And here we have the same styling option as in the parent column. So those were the key settings for the form fields. Now let's navigate back to the top left corner of the screen and continue with the remaining settings. The next item is the publish slash update button. Once your form is ready or you've made changes, you click on this button. The preview allows you to switch between different responsive modes. And the last one, the save draft option, allows you to save the form as a draft, 
Gutenberg automatically does it every 60 minutes to prevent any loss of data. So before we dive into creating a functional form, I want to show you something. If you're gonna click this plus icon over here, it will open up the fields library. Let's switch to the panels tab, scroll down and click on the chat form. Here you'll find various pre-made forms like contact form, register form, that you can use as a starting point to save time and effort. So just keep in mind that it exists. So now let's create a form for my fake supercar rental website. We're gonna start from scratch, so I'm gonna delete everything. I want to start with the personal information of the individual making this booking. So I want there to be a title that says driver's information. To do that, I'm gonna simply add a heading field. So I'm gonna click this plus icon and I'm gonna search for heading. And as you can see, we have two options. And that's because Gutenberg also has a heading field. Make sure you are choosing the Jet Form Builder one, which is the one with the color. Otherwise, you won't be able to style it in Elementor. So I'm gonna click to add it. Now I'm gonna go to the Block tab, and in the Field label, I'm gonna type Driver's Information. Now let's add fields for the actual information. So I want there to be fields for name, email, phone number, gender, we'll use a radio field for that, and also a media field for the driver's license upload. Now I want to place the name and the email field side by side. You already know how to do that. We'll add a parent column with two child columns. So I'll click anywhere to bring out the plus icon, click on it, and as you can see, the column appears. So I'm gonna click once to add it, and now I'm gonna select two child columns layout. So for the name, email, and phone number fields, we're gonna use a text field because it allows capturing various types of text, including letters for the name, numbers for the phone, and symbols for the email. So I'm gonna click the plus icon in the left child column, and I'm gonna add a text field. Now let's go to the settings. So in the block tab, I'm gonna name the label full name, which will automatically fill out the field name. I'm gonna add an underscore at the beginning to make it more unique. No field description, no default value, field type text, and now I'm gonna add a max limit of 50 characters. Now let's go to the second column. Select the column, click the plus icon, and add a text field. In the settings, I'm gonna name the label email. I'm gonna add an underscore at the beginning of the field name. No field description, no default value. I'm gonna change the field type to email, and I'm also gonna set a limit of 50 characters. Now let's move on to the next two fields, which I also want them to be next to each other. So we can either add another parent column with two child columns, or we can use these existing columns. But be aware that in mobile view, the fields in the left column will be displayed before the fields in the right column, which may affect the desired field order. You don't want a phone number field between the first and last name field. So keep this in mind if the order of the fields is important. So I'm gonna go to the left column, and I'm gonna add another text field by duplicating the existing one. In the toolbar, I'm gonna click these three dots, and then I'm gonna click duplicate. Now in the settings, I'm gonna change the label name to phone. The field name is gonna be also phone with the underscore at the beginning. I'm gonna scroll down to the field type and change it to telephone. I'm gonna remove the maximum character limit since we'll be using the input mask, which also limits the characters. I'm gonna enable the input mask. I'm gonna scroll down and use the suggested phone number that appears here. So I'm gonna copy and paste. And the rest of the settings we're gonna leave as is. The next field we're gonna add for gender is a radio field. Because with the radio field, we can create a list of options where only one option can be selected at a time. So I'm gonna select the right column, and to add the radio field, I can duplicate this field like I did before and convert it to a radio field. Or I can select the single column, and you will see the plus icon appearing. I'm gonna click on it, and in the search bar, I'm gonna search for radio. And I'm gonna click to add it. We're gonna go to fill options from, and here we have six options to choose from for pulling information. In this case, we're gonna select manual input. Next, I'm gonna click on manage items and fill out these fields. In the label field, which will be visible in the front end, we're gonna type mail. Since we don't have a specific value, you can either type a number or type mail here as well. So I'm gonna type mail. The calculate field, we're gonna leave empty. To add another option, you can click here as many times as you want, or you can clone the current option. So I'm gonna click on clone and make changes. Female and female. By the way, as you can see, we have here the save deleting option, which means that even if you remove an option, the data associated with it will remain in the backend and won't be lost. So now when you are done, just click update. But don't forget to go to the settings and name the label, we're gonna name it gender, and add an underscore to the field name. And now we are done with the radio field. 
Next, I want the person making the booking to upload a picture of their driver's license. We're gonna use a media feed for that. Because the media feed allows users to upload media files, such as images, videos, or documents, it provides a convenient way to collect files from users directly within a form. So I'm gonna click anywhere to bring out the plus icon, click on the plus icon, and I'm gonna search for media, and click once to add it. Now I'm gonna go to the settings and name the label Upload Your Driver's License. I'm gonna add another score at the beginning of the field name, no field description, and in the user access, you can choose the type of users that will be able to upload media files. My advice is not to let unregistered users to upload files for security reasons, so I'm gonna select any registered users. Next is insert attachment. If somebody uploaded an image to your site and you don't see it in the media library, it's because insert attachment is turned off, so I'm gonna turn it on. Next is the field value. Here we have three options, which refer to the way the media is processed in the site's code. The attachment ID is used internally by the website system, while the attachment URL is a public web address that allows users to access and interact with it. So if you want to link to this image with a macro, choose attachment URL. In this case, I'm gonna select attachment ID. Maximum allowed files to upload is a feature that allows you to set the maximum number of files a user can upload. So I'm gonna type one, although if I'm gonna leave it empty, it will default to one file. In the maximum size in MB, you can type the maximum file size a user can upload. I'm gonna make it 2 MB. Next is the maximum file size message, which is a notification that appears when a user attempts to upload an image that is larger than the maximum allowed file size, in our case 2 MB. In the allow MIME types, you can select the file types that users are allowed to upload. If no option are selected, all file types will be allowed for upload. So to add a media field, simply start typing the extensions you are looking for. Let's say MP4. It will appear and click to add it. Or you can type, let's say, an image and all the available image extensions will appear. Click on the one you want to add. So I'm going to add JPEG, GIF, and PNG. And that's it. Those were the key settings of the media field. Let's move on to the next field. So let's say the person making the booking is not the only driver. I want to provide him the option to add information for additional drivers. We're going to do this by using a repeater field. A repeater field is useful when you need to allow users to repeat a set of fields multiple times. So by clicking a button, the driver will dynamically add as many sets of driver information fields as needed. So to add a repeater field, I'm going to click anywhere to bring the plus icon, click the plus icon, and I'm going to search for repeater, and then click to add. Now I'm going to add to the repeater the fields I want to be repeated. So in my case, these are the five fields that we've created so far. To add a field to the repeater, I can use the forward slash shortcut, or by clicking the plus icon. But instead of manually adding and configuring each field, I can save time by duplicating the existing fields and placing them within the repeater, and then just change their field name. So this time I'm gonna use the list view. I'm gonna select the fields I want to duplicate, which are the columns and the media field. Click the three dots and then duplicate. Next, I'm gonna select the duplicated layers and drag them into the repeater. And now I'm gonna go to each field and change the field's name. I'm gonna add an R at the beginning of each field name to indicate that it belongs to the repeater. But don't forget to name the repeater itself. So I'm gonna select the repeater, I'm gonna leave the label empty, and I'm gonna name the field name, add driver. And of course, add another score at the beginning. Next, I'm gonna scroll down to add new item label, and we also gonna name it add driver. And we are done with the repeater field. Next, I want to show you how to make fields required. Simply select the fields you want to mark as required. In my case, it's all of the fields except the repeater field. And enable the required toggle in the toolbar. This ensures that users must fill out those fields before submitting the form. So we are done with the personal information fields. Let's click publish and switch to Elementor to see how it looks on the front end. All I have here is a container with a blue background. To add a form to Elementor is quite simple. I click the plus icon in the middle of the container, which will open up the widgets tab on the left. In the search bar, I'm gonna search for jet form and click once to add it. 
In the choose form, you have a list of all the available forms on your site. I'm gonna select mine, which is Supercard Booking. And as you can see, all the fields that we created in Jet Form Builder are now visible on this Elementor page. Now to see if the repeater is working, we're gonna go Publish and Preview. Now let's click on it. And as you can see, it works. Let's just close those. And that's it. Perfect. Now let's continue with building the rest of the form. I'm gonna switch back to Jet Form. And now I want to add fields for the booking details, such as car brand, location, pickup date, pickup time, and so on. We're gonna start by adding a heading. So I'll go to the list view, select the existing heading, and duplicate it. In the toolbar, I'm gonna click the six dots, drag it all the way down until you see this blue line, and let go. Next, I'm gonna go to the settings and name the label booking details. For the next two fields, I want to add a column with two child columns. In the left column, I want to add the car brands. And I'm gonna use a radio field for that again, because we need a field that can display a list of options where only one option can be selected at a time. So I'm gonna click the plus icon and then the radio field to add it. But this time we're not gonna select manual input because the information already exists as a taxonomy in my booking custom post type. So I'm gonna pull the information from there. So I'm gonna click here to see the options. We're gonna select terms and the taxonomy is gonna be brands. Next, I'm gonna make this feed required. I'm gonna go to the settings and name the label brands. And in the field name, I'm gonna add an underscore at the beginning. Next, I would like to include an option for users to add additional items such as GPS, child seat, etc. And for this, I will use a checkbox field since it allows users to select multiple options. So I'm gonna go to the right column and click the plus icon and search for checkbox and then click to add it. The information I want to pull also already exists in my custom post type as a custom field. So let me show you how to pull the information from there. So I'm gonna click here to see the options. I'm gonna select generate dynamically. The generator function will be get values list from jet engine feed options. And now it asks for the feed name. So to get the feed name, I'm gonna go to my dashboard to my custom post type booking, add new. I'm gonna go to extras and I'm gonna click here to copy the name. I'm gonna go back and paste here the name. Next, I'm gonna go to the label and give it the same name, extras. And I'm gonna add another score at the beginning of the field name. Next, I want to add pickup location option. And to do that, we'll use a select field. This is a great choice because we have many location options available and the select field will appear as a drop-down menu, which won't take up too much space on the form. So to add the select field, I'm gonna scroll down, click anywhere, then the plus icon, and I'm gonna search for select field, and then click to add it. Now let's say this is a booking site for the US, and I don't want to manually add all 50 states, right? Also, I don't have this information in my custom post type to pull from. So what we're gonna do is use a glossary. A glossary is a list of terms in a specific field. In this case, we need a list of the US states. Just make sure that it's in a CSV or JSON format. So go to Google and search for US state CSV, then scroll down. And I think that this one works for me. Click on this link, scroll down until you see CSV. Click download CSV file, show in folder. I'm gonna switch to my dashboard, media library, and I'm gonna drop it here. Next, I'm gonna go to the Croco Block tab and click on Jet Engine, click on Glossaries, add new glossary. The name's gonna be US States. The data source is gonna be get items from uploaded file, select file, select the file that we just uploaded, use this file, scroll down, save. Now let's go back to our form. Select here Glossary, and from this list, select the glossary that we just uploaded, which doesn't appear. So we're gonna refresh. Manage items, Glossary, select Glossary, US States. Now don't forget to go to the settings, give the label a name, I'm gonna name it Pickup Location. I'm gonna add another score at the beginning with the field name. 
and now I'm gonna update and let's check how it looks in the front end. I'm gonna switch to Elementor and I'm gonna refresh. So here we have the last feeds that we've added to the form. The last three feeds can display lists. First we have the radio field, which allows you to select only one option at a time. Next we have the checkbox field, where you can select multiple options and also uncheck them if needed. And lastly we have the select field, which presents a drop down menu for long and list options. But you know what? We can take the select field one step further. So if I'm gonna switch to my dashboard, I'm gonna go to Dash Form Builder, Add ons, and here we have the pro add ons that can extend or add functionality to your forms. And the one we are looking for is the select autocomplete, which allows users to start typing in the input field, and as they type, a drop down menu with the matching option is displayed. Really cool. So install it and then activate add on. I'm gonna go back to my form and I'm gonna refresh. I'm gonna go to the list view, I'm gonna select the field, and now as you can see, we have a new option, use autocomplete. Enable it, and also enable loading via Ajax. And here you can set how many characters are required before the autocomplete feature kicks in. So I'm gonna make it one. Next, I'm gonna go to the settings, and in the placeholder, I'm gonna type choose a state. I'm gonna update, and let's go back to Elementor. I'm gonna refresh, and preview. And now let's see if it works. So I'm gonna search for California. As you can see, it appears, and now I can select it. Nice. The next feature I wanna show you how to use is conditional black. Conditional black allows you to show or hide form fields based on specific conditions. For example, in this case, I want to add a checkbox that says drop of car at different location. When this checkbox is checked, the drop of location feed will appear. So let me show you how to do it. I'm gonna switch back to jet form. We're gonna start with the checkbox field. So I'm gonna click anywhere that's empty to bring out the plus icon, click the plus icon, and then click the checkbox field to add it. Next, we're gonna go to the options form. We're gonna leave it as manual input, and I'm gonna click the manage items. I'm gonna name the label drop of car a different location and the value as well, and click update. Next, I'm gonna go to the settings. The field label is gonna be empty, but the field name we're gonna name also drop of car a different location, and I'm gonna add an other score at the beginning, of course. Now let's add the conditional black. So again, I'm gonna click anywhere, click the plus icon, and I'm gonna search for conditional. When it appears, click to add it. The feed we're gonna use for the drop of location is the same as we are using for the pickup location. So I'm gonna select the pickup location field, click the three dots, and duplicate. And now I'm gonna grab it and drag it into our conditional black. Next, I'm gonna go to the settings and I'm gonna change the field name and the label name. So the label name is gonna be drop of location and the field name is gonna be the same only with underscore at the beginning. And now let's configure the condition of the conditional black. So in the list view, I'm gonna select the conditional black. In the toolbar, I'm gonna click on the edit condition and events icon. Which function need to be executed? We're gonna select show if, and we're gonna add a condition. The field's gonna be drop of car at different location. The operator is going to be in the list. And the value to compare to is going to be drop of car at different location. Because that's what our checkbox says. Next, I'm going to click update. And also, I'm going to update the form. I'm going to switch to Elementor. And I'm going to refresh. And now, preview. Now, let's see if it works. So I'm going to scroll down. And here we have our checkbox which is our trigger field. I'm gonna check it and the field appears. I'm gonna uncheck it and it disappears. I'm using only one field, but you can use as many as you need. You can even add a conditional black within a conditional black for more advanced layouts. Now let's move on to the next fields. I'm gonna switch back to our jet form and now I want to add two fields next to each other. A date field for the pickup date and a time field for the pickup time. So I'm gonna add the column with two child columns. So I'm gonna click anywhere, click the plus icon and then click column. I'm gonna scroll down and I'm gonna select two child columns. In the left column, I'm gonna click the plus icon and I'm gonna search for date. And then click to add it. Next, we're gonna go to the settings and I'm gonna name the label pickup date, add an underscore the field name, and we're gonna scroll down to the is timestamp option and enable it. 
A timestamp is a record of the exact time something happened, and it's something that the book inside will typically need. Now let's add the time field, so I'm going to click the right column, click the plus icon, and search for time field. I already have it, so I'm going to click to add it. Next I'm going to go to the settings, and I'm going to name the label pick up time, and of course add an underscore at the beginning of the field name. Now I want to show you something, so I'm going to update, and we're going to switch to Elementor. I'm going to refresh. I'm going to scroll down to the date and time fields. And as you can see, they come with an input mask that I don't like. So let me show you what we're going to do. I'm going to switch back to jet form, select the date field, and give it a default value. So I want today's date to appear here. And we're going to achieve that using a macro. So I'm going to paste the macro. And we're going to do the same to the time field. Only this time, I'm going to give it a default value manually of 12 o'clock. And now let's check it in Elementor. So I'm going to update, switch to Elementor, refresh. And preview. I'm going to scroll down and we have today's date with 12 o'clock set as the time. Now let's continue. So I'm going to go back to jet form. And now I want to add fields that allow users to write freely. So we have two options for that, text area field or the WYSIWYG field. The text area field provides a plain text input, while the WYSIWYG editor offers more advanced options. You can format text, add styles, create lists, and more. It's similar to Elementor's text editor. In this case, we're going to choose text area field. Now I'm going to go to the settings. I'm going to name the label any special request and add another score at the beginning or the field name. Next, I want to add a checkbox field for signing up for a newsletter to show you something later. So I'm going to click anywhere, click the plus icon, and select checkbox field. I'm going to scroll down and go to manage items. The label is going to be sign up for our newsletter and the value as well. I'm going to update and we're going to leave the label empty, but we do going to name the field name also sign up for our newsletter and add another score at the beginning. Now I want to add another checkbox field. For the I agree to the terms and conditions statement. So I'm going to duplicate the newsletter checkbox field, manage items, click the edit icon, I'm going to give it a value of 1, and I'm going to name the label I agree to the terms and conditions. Now, I want the terms and condition words to be linked to the terms and condition page. So how do we do that? Let me show you. I'm going to click update, I'm going to click under the field, which will bring up the forward slash shortcut message. Now, if you're going to take a look at the list view, you're going to see that this message is a paragraph field. So we're going to use it as a paragraph field. I'm going to type here, I agree to the terms and conditions. I'm going to highlight the terms and condition words, go to the toolbar, click the link icon, and here I'm going to search for the terms and condition page. And when it appears, click on it. Next, I'm going to go to the right corner of the screen and click these three dots over here which are the Gutenberg's options. I'm going to go to Editor, and I'm going to switch to Code Editor. I'm going to scroll down and look for the Paragraph field. Here it is. Next, I'm going to search for the word Terms. And right before the word, I'm going to add a space character. So the words D and Terms won't be attached to each other. Next, I'm going to highlight this line, starting right after the Paragraph tag, and finishing before the last Paragraph tag. Click Copy. We're going to go back to the tools, editor, and change to the visual editor. I'm going to go to the list view and select the paragraph and delete it because we don't need it anymore. Next, I'm going to select the checkbox, manage items, click the edit icon, delete the odd label, and paste the new one. And then update. And now we have a checkbox with an ink. Now, don't forget to give it a name. I'm going to do it from the toolbar. I'm going to name it underscore terms. Now let's add the final element to a form, the submit button. So I'm going to click anywhere to bring out the plus icon. Click the plus icon. In the search bar, don't try looking for a submit button. You will not find it. Instead, look for an action button. And when it appears, add it. And we are done with the form fields. I'm going to update. And let's switch to Elementor and talk about the styling. Let me just refresh the page.
select the form, and in the left hand side switch to the style tab. Here you can customize the visual appearance of your form. It provides a wide range of options to control the colors, typography, spacing, background, borders, and other style related properties for your fields. And as you can see, it is divided into tabs for each element in your field. However, the main difference between styling the form in Elementor compared to Jet Style Manager is that in Elementor, when you make a change, it will affect all of the fields. Unlike with Jet Style Manager, where you have the power to affect a specific field individually. And the decision where to style it from depends on the specific case and requirements. So, for example, I have two heading fields on this form the driver's information and the booking details. If I'm going to go to the heading tab, typography, and I'm going to change the size to 20 pixel, the weight to 700, and the transform to capitalize, it will affect both of them. I can target just one of them from here. Let's move on to the label. I'm going to go to typography, and I'm just going to change the weight to 700. And as you can see, it affects the labels on all of the fields on this form. Now let me show you the opposite case. I'm gonna scroll down to the time field, and as you can see, it doesn't match the appearance of the other fields. The height is smaller, which creates inconsistency. If I were to go to the fields tab and change the padding from here, it would affect all of the fields on this form, and I just want to target the time field. That's why we're gonna do it in Jet Style Manager. So I'm gonna switch to Jet Form. In the list view, I'm gonna select the time field. I'm gonna go to the settings side. Click on the Jet Style Manager icon, go to Field, and give it a padding of 6 pixels. Next, I'm going to Update. I'm going to switch back to Elementor. I'm going to Refresh. And Preview. I'm going to scroll down, and as you can see, the height matches. Now, there are two more styling aspects that I want to address which cannot be done using Elementor or Jet Style Manager. We will need to use CSS and code to fix them. Firstly is the Select field, which also has a height problem caused by the Autocomplete feature. If you turn off the Autocomplete, it will look fine. However, since we want to use the Autocomplete functionality, we will use CSS to fix this issue. Secondly is the Media field. I feel there is too much empty space here. To fill this space, I will add a Media Placeholder. So let's do it. I'm going to switch to my Code page. I'm gonna scroll down to Jet Form Builder. We're gonna start with the Select field. So I'm gonna click the Select field CSS button to copy the code. We're gonna switch to Elementor. I'm gonna select the form. I'm gonna go to Advanced, scroll down to Custom CSS, and paste here the code. I'm gonna go back to the code page, and this time I'm gonna copy the Media Placeholder code. So I'm gonna click to copy, go back. I'm gonna scroll down. I'm gonna go to the Widgets tab. I'm gonna grab an HTML widget and drop it just beneath our form. And in the settings, I'm gonna paste the code. I'm gonna publish and preview. And now we have a media placeholder in the media field and we have fixed the height issue in the select field. Now, if you want, you can customize the media placeholder by uploading your own image to the media library. So I'm gonna switch to my dashboard, media, library, and let's say this is the image I want to use. So I'm gonna click on it. I'm gonna go to the file URL and I'm gonna start copying right after the domain name. Control C to copy. I'm gonna go back to Elementor and in the code, I'm gonna replace the current URL with the new one. So highlight and paste. And now we have the new media placeholder. So that's how you do it. And we are done with the styling. Feel free to continue customizing the form according to your preferences and styling needs. The next thing I want to show you is how to use break fields. Break fields are used in a form to create separation between different parts of the form. This way you enhance the user experience, make it more intuitive and user friendly. So in our form, I'm going to add a breakpoint after the driver's information right here and another breakpoint after the booking details right here. So I'm going to switch to jet form. I'm going to go to the list view. And I'm gonna select the field I want to insert the break field after, which in our case is the repeater field. So I'm gonna select the add driver repeater field. I'm gonna go to the plus icon, scroll down, and here we have the form page break. I'm gonna click to add it. 
I'm going to go back to the list view. And as you can see, it's right after the repeater field. I'm going to go to the settings in the right hand side. Click on the settings icon. By default, the next button is enabled, which is what we need. In the next button label, you can customize the text displayed on the button. If you're going to leave it empty, it will say next. We're going to leave it empty. And we're also going to leave the add previous page button disabled since this is the first part of the form and there is no previous part. We will leave the label of progress empty for now and we'll come back for it later. No validation message and no CSS class name. Next, we're going to go back to the list view and we're going to duplicate this form page break. And we're going to drag it and drop it just above the any special request field, which is the text area field. We're going to go to the settings and we're going to enable the add previous page button. Now to add a back button on the last part of the form, we won't use a break field. Instead, we're going to select the submit button, settings, advanced, and we're going to enable the option from here. Now we're going to click update and switch to Elementor. Refresh and preview. And as you can see, the form is cut off right after the repeater field, the way we want it. And here we have the next button. If you're going to leave any required fields unfilled, you won't be able to proceed to the next part of the form. However, it can be confusing as there is no explicit message or indication to inform you about this issue. Although the validation message option is available, it bothers me because it constantly appears above the next button, which is not ideal. So to fix it, I'm going to switch to the dashboard, Jet Form Builder, Settings, and switch off the Disable Next Button option. We're going to switch back, refresh, and now when you click the Submit button, a message appears telling you what's wrong. Now, obviously, you can style this button. So if I'm going to switch back to the Elementor Editor, I'm going to select the form, I'm going to go to Style, Form Break Row, and I'm going to align the buttons to the right. Next, I'm going to go to Form Break Buttons, I'm going to scroll down, and in the normal state, I'm going to change the border type to None, the background color to Blue, and the text color to White. In the Hover state, I'm going to give it a border type of Solid, the width is going to be 1, and the color is going to be Blue. The background color is going to be white and the text color is going to be black. And I'm going to do the same to the previous button. And that's all the design we're going to do. Now, if you are using break fields on your form, you might also want to add a progress bar that will let your users see how far they have progressed and how much is remaining. To enable the progress bar, we're going to switch to the content tab. I'm going to turn on the enable form pages progress. And now as you can see, the progress bar appears. You can also enable this option from Jet Form Builder, just so you know. Now, if you want to style it, go to the style tab, scroll down, and you can style it from these two tabs over here. The next thing I want to show you is how to name the progress stages. For example, I want the first stage to be driver's information, the second stage to be booking details, and the third stage to be finished and submit. So to do that, I'm going to switch back to Jet Form Builder. I'm going to select the first form page break. I'm going to go to settings, label of progress, and I'm going to type here driver's information. Now we're going to select the second form page break. Go to settings and name the label of progress booking details. Now to name the last stage of the progress bar, we will need to add another form page break after the submit button. So I'm going to duplicate this form page break and I'm going to drag it under the submit button. And now I'm going to go to the settings and I'm going to change the label of progress name to finish and submit. Now I'm going to update. I'm going to switch to Elementor, publish and preview. And now we have a progress bar with text indication for each stage of the form. Now let's switch to Jet Form and continue configuring the form settings. In the settings, I'm going to select the Jet Form tab. In the summary, we got the post status. When was it published? And here you can click to delete it. Moving on to the form settings. Note that we have the same settings available in Elementor as well. You need to decide whether to configure them here in Jet Form or in Elementor. You can't make changes in both places at the same time. So the first thing is the feeds layout. Let me switch to Elementor real quick to show you visually what does it mean. 
So by default it is set to column, but you can set it to row as well, which means that the label will be to the left of the field. I'm going to switch it back. Here you can set the required mark, you can even type here required. The fields label HTML tag we're going to leave as div. And in the submit type, we have two options. Preload, which means that the form is submitted traditionally with the page reload. It's like refreshing the page. And then we have Ajax, which allows the form to be submitted without a page reload. It uses JavaScript to set the form data in the background, providing a smoother user experience. So we're going to go with Ajax. And the enable form pages progress you already know. Let's switch back. Next is the validation. Here you can add two additional layers of protection to your form. Validation helps verify that the request is coming from a trusted source and not from a malicious attacker. It enhances the security of your site. However, it's important to disable caching on the page where the form is located to prevent potential errors. So I'm going to enable them both. Next is the validation messages, and here you can customize them. Here you can set up CAPTCHA to ensure that the form is filled out by a human and not by a bot. Cockerbrook has a video on their channel that provides a step-by-step -step guide on how to set it up. Next we have the most important part of the settings, the post-submit actions. Post-submit action refers to the actions that occur after a form is successfully submitted by the user. So I'm going to add a new action. I'm going to scroll down. Let's go to the actions list. And here you can find things like sending email notification, redirecting to a thank you page, saving for data to a data page, executing custom code, integrating with third-party services, and much more. In my case, since I have a custom post type named Booking that will receive all the information from the form, I'm going to select Insert Update Post. However, in a situation where you don't have a dedicated custom post type to store form data, you can utilize the Save Form Records option. This option is similar to the Submission option in Elementor, and it's more suitable for simpler forms, such as contact forms or general data collection forms. So in my case again, we're going to go with Insert Update Post. Next, I'm going to click on the Edit Action icon. The post type is going to be Booking. The post status after submission is going to be Pending Review. And now we need to map the fields. So if I'm going to switch back to my dashboard, I'm going to go to my custom post type booking, add new. You will see that for every field we have created in the form, we have a matching field here in the custom post type, and we need to link them together. So let's go back. So the first one is full name. I'm going to link it to post title, which is a WordPress field. Next is the phone number. I'm going to link it to custom field, which means that in the list you need to select post meta and now it asks for the meta so we're going to switch back go to the phone field and click here to copy the meta we're going to switch back and paste it here all the rest of the feeds is the same procedure so i'm going to speed up this part Once you're done, click update. Next, we're going to add another post submit action. You're not limited to just one. You can add as many as you need. This time, we're going to add the send email action to send the booking confirmation email to the person who submitted the form. So I'm going to add new action. By default, it comes with the send email option. I'm going to click edit actions. Now let's fill out this page. In the mail tool, we're going to use the email address of the user who filled out this form. So I'm going to select email for submitted form field. And the field is going to be email. The reply to means the email address where you want the recipient to reply to. So we're going to make it custom email and we're going to paste our email. The subject is going to be booking confirmation. From name is going to be my name, Benny. From email address means the email address that appears as the sender of the email. So I'm going to copy this mail and I'm going to paste it here. Next, I'm going to scroll down. The content type sentence refers to the formatting of the email content. You have two options, plain text and HTML. Plain text sends the email with simple unformatted text. It does not support any styling such as colors, font, or images. On the other hand, HTML provides more flexibility in terms of design and layout, 
With HTML, you can include images, links, and other visual elements in the email content. So I'm going to select HTML. Additionally, you can use macros in the content field to dynamically pull and include the information entered in the form fields within this email. So for example, I can type booking confirmation. I'm going to go to the next line. I'm going to type hey, comma, and I'm going to add the full name macro. And continue with this are your booking details. Go to the next line. Type car brand. And add the brand macro. And so on. So just to sum it up, this is an example of how a plain text email looks like. Boring, right? And this is an example of how an HTML email looks like, which is more visually appealing and attractive, right? Now, if you don't know HTML, you can use ChatGPT to create it. That's what I did. So when you are done, click update. Now let's go back to the post submit action and see the remaining option. If you're going to click the question mark icon, you'll get details about the action. In the three dots menu, you can rearrange the position of the action, delete it or disable it if needed. And here we have the edit condition and events option. This allows you to define conditions that must be met for this action to take place. So for example, I'm going to scroll down. I'm going to add a new action. We're going to leave it as send email. And now I'm going to use the newsletter checkbox as the field that must be checked in order for this email to be sent. So I'm going to select the field. I'm going to scroll down, manage items, edit, and I'm going to copy the label, update. I'm going to come back to the send email action and click on edit condition and events. The setup is very similar to the conditional block that we did before. So the conditional operator will be all condition must be met. We're going to add a new condition. The operator is going to be in the list of which field? The sign up for newsletter field. The type transform comparing value we're going to leave empty. And here we're going to paste the value that we copied before. Sign up for the newsletter. And click update. And now only when the sign up for newsletter checkbox is checked, this email will be sent. Now let's continue with the settings. The next option is to set up a preset value globally for the fields on this form. This is very useful for editing existing forms. Next, we have the general messaging settings. Here you can customize the message displayed for users, such as success messages, error messages, and validation messages. And that's it for the form settings. And now let's switch to the dashboard and navigate to JetForm Builder to explore the remaining options. Forms. This section displays all the forms you created using JetForm. You can manage and edit them from here. The add new you already know this is how you create a new form. Settings. In this section, you can configure various settings related to payment getaways, captcha settings, and marketing tools. Form records. When you select the form records option in the post submit action, the form submission will be stored in this section. And we have the add ons, which we've already seen. I actually want to install another add on that I believe is a must have the Save Form Progress add on. So install it and then click Activate Add on. I'm going to go back to Jet Form. I'm going to update and refresh. I'm going to go to the settings to the Jet Form tab. I'm going to scroll down. And here we have a new section for the form progress. So I'm going to enable them both. And then click update again. Switch to Elementor, publish, and preview. Now let's see the form save progress in action. I will quickly fill out this part of the form. And now I will exit to my home page. Come back. And as you can see, the fill out feeds are still here. I can even refresh the page and the filled out fields will not be deleted. They will disappear only after submission. It's a really powerful feature. Now let's continue filling out the rest of the form. And when you are done, click submit. And only after a successful submission, if I'm going to refresh, you're going to see that the information is gone. Now let's switch to my dashboard. I'm going to go to my custom post type bookings. And as you can see, our booking appears and it's waiting approval. If I'm going to click on it, you will see all the information we filled out in the form. Now, before we wrap up this video, I want to show you two more things. 
The third thing I want to show you is how to create reusable blocks in JetForm. So I'm going to switch to JetForm. And let's say you have fields that you use repeatedly in your forms, such as personal information fields. So what you can do is create them once and then select all of them. Click the three dots. Select create reusable block. And now we're going to name it personal information. And click save. And now if I'm going to go to the plus icon, you're going to see the reusable black icon over here. Click on it, and here you have the personal feeds all configured and ready to use. Really nice. The second thing I want to show you is a solution for those who have a lot of forms that were built with Jet Engine forms and don't want to start from scratch in Jet Form Builder. There is a plugin available that can convert a Jet Engine form to a Jet Form Builder form, and you can find it on GitHub. So in GitHub, I'm going to click on the code button, download zip. I'm going to go to the zip, show in folder. Then I'm going to go to my dashboard, plugins, add new, upload plugin. And I'm going to grab the zip file and drop it over here. Install now and activate. And now, if I'm going to go to Jet Engine, Forms, and I'm going to hover over one of these forms, you're going to see a new option, Convert to New Builder. Click on it, and it will open up in Jet Form Builder, and now it's converted. So that's how you do it. And that concludes this video. I hope you now have a better understanding of Jet Form Builder's capabilities. In the description, you'll find all the resources mentioned. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'm going to see you in the next one.